Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Quick note before we begin, the Finding Genius Foundation, as part of the Finding Genius Podcast, has recently completed a book about understanding viruses. So the creation of this book was to interview a 100 virologists, ask them a lot of deep, difficult questions, take the most difficult questions, and then re-interview the top 25 or so and ask them the hardest questions I could think of. And we compiled that all into a book. So you'll see question and four or five experts' answers. Question, four or five experts' answers. There's about 30 questions in the book. I think it's a great read for the layperson and for the researcher. It talks about a lot of speculation in the world of viruses, such as are they alive or not? And why is it important? Uh, why do viruses go latent or hidden or ineffective or sit in a person or an animal or another creature for weeks, months, years, and then suddenly become virulent and affect that person? Uh, so there's a lot of really provocative questions in the book. It's now on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon and type in Finding Genius, you'll see the book on viruses. It's also on Kindle. The Audible version is in production and should be ready in approximately a month. But if you want to go and order it now, uh, you can do so, again, by going to Amazon or Kindle or go, go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org and go to Publications. There's an opportunity as well to get the transcripts of all the interviews and to hear the original interviews themselves. If we had put them all together, the book would be about a 1,000 pages, but we condensed them down to make it juicy and concise and tight and very interesting. So I hope you'll check out the book. Uh, we're now working on one about cancer, but this is going to be our goal is uh, three times a year to come out with these masterclass books that I think will inspire new scientific research, and I hope you'll check it out. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. Um, my guest today is Jeannie Drisco. Uh, she's a professor emeritus at University of Kansas Medical Center. She's a founder and past director of KU Integrative Medicine. She's a translational research scientist. And uh, one topic she appears to be focusing on is intravenous vitamin C and how it may treat uh, pancreatic cancer and other conditions. So, Jeannie, thanks for coming. Hi, thank you for inviting me. Well, tell me about your background. What got you, um, what, what involved you in your work for so many years and then why the, uh, the interest in vitamin C? Well, I was a classically trained medical doctor and really just was following the usual trajectory not really paying much attention to nutrition or uh, vitamins, minerals, until about 1990, I really got burnt out. And I was in bed and really not doing well. I think it, yeah, I mean, you might cl call it classic chronic fatigue, or but I was just burnt out from working. And I had a friend who said that he had just been to a meeting and learned about a few vitamins and minerals. And he gave me just a, a list with a handful of vitamins and minerals. So I took them and I was better within a very short period of time. And I really got upset because I didn't learn this in medical school. I didn't learn anything about nutrition. I didn't learn anything about vitamins and minerals. So I felt like I needed to go back and retrain. And at first I was going to meetings and meeting people around the country that specialized in nutritional medicine, we'll call it that for now. But finally, I realized I needed to sit at someone's knee and really learn how the practice is done correctly. And I asked a lot of my friends around the country and they kept telling me, you need to go study with Hugh Reardon. Hugh Reardon, his name kept coming up. He was in Wichita, Kansas, and was actually internationally known for his work in nutritional medicine. And I uh, went down over a year and uh, trained. And one of the things he did in his clinic was give intravenous vitamin C. And he had worked with some of the pioneers around the world in intravenous vitamin C. So he was really a go-to person for this therapy. And after I finished my training with Hugh, I was asked by the dean of the School of Medicine, uh, Debbie Powell, 
at the University of Kansas Medical Center to come and start a program in integrative medicine. This was in the 90s. And at that time, every medical school wanted to have an integrative medicine program. They thought, you know, it was just like the cool thing to do for medical schools. They didn't know what that meant. And so I was really allowed to invent it any way that I wanted. Well, I started the program and I realized that I needed to have intravenous vitamin C as part of the program. And when I had learned to use the therapy, there were all kinds of patients that were treated by Dr. Reardon. They may have had cancer. They may have had chronic fatigue. They may have had fibromyalgia. They may have had mononucleosis. So there was a variety of conditions that it was helpful for. But he always started by looking at their base nutrient levels. So looking at vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin C, et cetera, and repleting that, changing the diet, and then using these other therapies like IV vitamin C as a, as a treatment. So I realized this is how I wanted to run my clinic. So I also knew being part of an academic center that you really needed to provide research and you know this topic that IV vitamin C in particular, because there was so very little research around the topic and uh, I needed to do education So I needed to train the future integrative medicine doctors or the future nutritional medicine doctors. And I needed to uh, have service. So I sat on uh, committees at KU at the medical center. I sat on committees nationally and including one Institute of Medicine committee where we wrote a report on integrative medicine. And, uh, you know, so these things are all woven into what makes a good academic program. So I did provide all of those pillars, let's call them pillars of the academic center, but the research really turned out to be a lot of fun. And I got to meet people from all around the world who were doing vitamin C research. And one of my closest colleagues is Mark Levine at the National Institutes of Health. He has a lab at NIDDK. He's also a classically trained medical doctor and uh, provides uh, research in, in nutritional underpinnings of health. And he just so happened to pick vitamin C as his original vitamin that he was going to study in humans. So we got to be very close friends. And at the time, early on, his postdoc was Dr. K. Chen, and she published some of the seminal papers on how vitamin C works in the human body. So after she finished her postdoc, she came to KU Medical Center and we formed this team. She does the basic science, the cell tissue animal studies, and I provide the human clinical trials. And so this is what's called translational medicine, where you take things from the bench to the bedside. So it's been a great partnership. So let's talk about intravenous vitamin C. It seems like that's a focus for you. What conditions is it used for and why does it work? What's, what are the mechanisms of action for it? Well, there's a big difference between the oral vitamin C and the intravenous vitamin C. And I don't think a lot of people really understand that. So when you take vitamin C by mouth, it has these wonderful vitamin like activities, making the collagen, the supportive structures of the body stronger. It helps the immune system. It does a whole host of really important things in the body. Uh, But when you take it in the vein, it no longer has that pure vitamin like property. It becomes a drug when you push it into the vein and it gets these very high levels. It'll go from the vein into what's called the extracellular space. And in the extracellular space, it becomes something called a prooxidant. So it's no longer an antioxidant fighting that oxidative damage, it now becomes a prooxidant and forms what's called hydrogen peroxide in that extracellular space, that space around the cells. But this doesn't happen in the bloodstream. The body protects itself very, very well. So this only happens in the extracellular space. And it's because of this hydrogen peroxide formation in the extracellular space that you can kill viruses that you can kill bacteria, 
that you can kill abnormal cells like cancer cells, for example. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. So most of our research has been in cancer. Uh, we looked at ovarian cancer. We've looked at pancreatic cancer. We're now doing a study in bladder cancer. So those are some of the, gives you some of the ideas of, of how vitamin C can be used. But we're really interested right now in uh, COVID-19, in SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, and finding out if IV vitamin C can be given to help with the uh, actual killing of that virus. So we're doing initial cell tissue work right now and starting animal studies. But what I would like to emphasize, I want to go back to this idea of the oral versus the IV. And some people think that if they take enough oral vitamin C, that it can be equivalent to the IV vitamin C. But the body's mechanism won't allow that from happening. And there are some manufacturers that actually say, oh, you take my form of vitamins, of oral vitamin C, and it's equivalent to IV vitamin C. And that's a marketing scam. That's not true. Yeah, why are they so different? What's the difference there? Well, the body really handles the vitamin C in a very specific way. So when you take it by mouth, it becomes, it goes into the gut. And there are transporters in the gut that allow just a little bit of the vitamin C to cross over into the bloodstream. And so it's controlled. The body doesn't like to flood itself with a lot of vitamin C. So it's tightly controlled. And then as soon as it gets into the bloodstream, it's picked up by the kidneys and excreted. So not enough of it gets out of the bloodstream to be able to go into that extracellular space. But when you inject it in the vein, it bypasses the gut. It bypasses that tight control. And so you can get a thousand fold more vitamin C in the bloodstream than you could by taking it by mouth. So that therein lies the difference. And you said it forms uh, peroxides, preferentially not in the blood, but in the interstitial fluid. That's correct. So in that, that space, that fluidy space around all the cells. And then what's so interesting is the hydrogen peroxide is what's called a a promiscuous molecule. It does all kinds of things that we can't even follow it. It's so fast, but it, it can go into inside the cell and it can cause a reduction of the energy currency, the ATP, It also can cause double-stranded DNA breaks, which can kill an abnormal cell. Now, what's so interesting about this is in a normal cell and around normal cells, you have machinery to break down that hydrogen peroxide. So it can't damage normal cells. But those abnormal cells are really much more primitive And they don't have all that machinery to break down the hydrogen peroxide. So the hydrogen peroxide gets taken up and in this abnormal cell can't be broken down. And so then the hydrogen peroxide goes to work, wiping out the ATP, breaking down the DNA and causing the cell to die. But it only preferentially affects cells that have turned cancerous is your observation. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Uh, Yes, and we've shown that in cell tissue work and in animal studies repeatedly, and that our studies have been repeated all around the world and shown to be being able to be replicated. 
So it's not just a one-off kind of a thing that we've seen by chance. This has been replicated around the world. So what's been observed clinically uh, in people that have cancer? Like what's the protocol? How many IVs do they get? Do they get weekly or monthly? And what, oh, that's what's observed so, in a one time scale? Yeah, that's really a great question. So uh, uh, some people think that you can take the, the uh, intravenous vitamin C, the IV vitamin C, maybe once or twice a month and, and call it good. But really, it has a very slow, progressive action. So you need, if you have an aggressive tumor, like a pancreatic tumor, you're going to need to take that IV vitamin C three times a week. And you need to repeat that continuously for a month or two before you repeat, let's say your imaging studies or your tumor markers because of its slow action. But if you're consistent, persistent, you will see a reduction usually in tumor volume and in tumor markers. And then you continue. But let's say you've gone three or four months and you really don't see much anti-cancer activity, then it's safe to say, well, maybe it's not going to work in this case and you can stop. But you really shouldn't just do once or twice a month and, and then say, oh, it didn't do anything because that's not a fair trial. Vitamin C isn't anything like a chemotherapy. And speaking of chemotherapy, a lot of oncologists think of vitamin C as an antioxidant and their chemotherapies are pro-oxidative and they think that the vitamin C is going to inhibit their chemotherapy. But we've shown repeatedly that uh, because it, the vitamin C given in the vein is a pro-oxidative therapy, it actually can work hand in hand with chemotherapy. And our colleagues at the University of Iowa show that it works hand in hand with radiation therapy because it's also a pro-oxidative therapy. So when you give IV vitamin C, you can give it with a chemotherapy and find this additive or synergistic effect that it's more synergistic. It's more than one plus one equals two. It's more like one plus one equals three or four. So you get a, even a more robust effect. And another interesting thing we found in our ovarian cancer study, it was the first randomized controlled trial in the United States using intravenous vitamin C in a cancer with chemotherapy. And so we were, because we were really the first to do this, we felt that we were asked to oversample for safety. That was one of our mandates was really to show how safe it was when added to chemotherapy. And what we found was not only was it effective in reducing the burden of the ovarian cancer and prolonging life in these, these women, but we also showed very conclusively that it was safe and it actually reduced some of the side effects from the chemotherapy. So the grade one, grade two, grade three uh, adverse events which are very, very common in cancer therapy, the vitamin C actually reduced the number of those adverse events. So it's not only safe, but it uh, makes people feel better as well. What about um, lymphomas or blood cancers or leukemias? You know, then the cancer supposedly is in the blood or the uh -huh. lymph. Like it's bloodborne cancers with the peroxides work there uh, mm -hmm. or they, would they not work in the blood? And, you know, what happens there? Boy, that's a really good question. We found that when the vitamin C can get up close and personal to that cancer, there's usually a, a very effective cell kill. And that includes the bloodborne tumors. So those tumors will also uh, some, somewhat take up the vitamin C, but that whole milieu will allow that hydrogen peroxide to be formed in that, that cancer cell. So there is effective cell kill of the uh, lymphomas and leukemias. And that's one of the reasons why we chose bladder cancer, because we wanted that IV vitamin C to be up close and personal to the lining of the bladder where the bladder cancer forms. And because we know that it is uh, excreted out of the kidneys, it doesn't go through liver first pass. It goes 
directly from the bloodstream to the kidneys and out in the urine. So if you're going to be uh, excreting, peeing out a lot of that vitamin C, it's going to sit in the bladder and cause an effect in the, in the lining of the bladder. So is how many different cancers have uh, been used with intravenous vitamin C and how many of them you know, had positive effects and which ones seem to be the most positive or the least positive? You know, the more difficult cancers are very, uh, very poorly treated by much of anything. So we chose pancreatic cancer because that's generally a lethal sentence when you get a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. And we had anecdotally, you know, in our clinic and other colleagues of ours had treated pancreatic cancer and found that there was a benefit. And I'll say another anecdotal piece of, a, uh, of uh, information that I learned from my experience was that if it's a familial, if it's a, it seems to run in families, so maybe there's a genetic component, those are very well treated by IV vitamin C, those forms of pancreatic cancer. But that being said, pancreatic cancer is very difficult to treat. And a lot of the patients are heavily pre-treated with chemotherapy. Uh, Some of them have surgery. Most of them don't because by the time they find it, it's very advanced. Uh, But uh, when you heavily pre-treat someone with a a tumor and then send them to vitamin C, that's not going to be very effective. It's really vitamin C in the vein should be started at the beginning of the treatment. Then you have a better chance. But, but here we come to two problems. One is, you know, I know I've had thyroid cancer, at least. We you know when you have cancer, you're afraid you're going to die right then and there a lot of times, um, at least initially. And there's tremendous pressure to go with standard of care. And then also, from what I understand, if you don't undergo standard of care, chemo and everything else, um, it could be very problematic for you in terms of getting care or, I mean, who knows what else. So I'm sure it is better to use, well, I would guess it's better to use vitamin C first intravenously before chemo, but do you often get that luxury or what do you do with people that have had chemo and now still need help? We have treated relapsed patients that have gone through their standard of care. We had, uh, because of our ovarian cancer research, we had a lot of women come to our clinic that had gone through the six month paclitaxel carboplatin treatment, failed, which they often do. And, um, and then started up with uh, an adjuvant chemotherapy and added the IV vitamin C and had, uh, you know, again, this is anecdotal, but it, it can be helpful. But if you're heavily pretreated, the fulfirinox, the full fox that they're giving to the pancreatic cancer patients now, even the youngest patients, it's very difficult to go through. And, you know, if you've gone through that heavy cancer treatment like that, then coming in when you relapsed again, it's, it's probably not a good idea. Well, what's, um, have you been able to compare side by side people that have had chemo and then get the vitamin C versus haven't had it and how much better are the effects or do they completely go away or do they become negative? We have had some patients that there's their tumor has resolved with the IV vitamin C with added to their chemotherapy. Uh, this was in uh, trials. Uh, we've also had people that that didn't respond very well. So it's all over the map. And I, it's not a simplistic story, I don't think, because it isn't just the IVC and no IVC. But there's a whole bunch of other things that need to be done. Uh, like, what are you eating? How's your diet? How's your lifestyle? Are you exposed to environmental toxicity in your home or wherever your work, whatever? And so these are things that we have to look at globally with patients. And so is it, you know, on the margin, is it just the IV vitamin C or is it this whole treatment package? And those are some of the things we try to tease out, of course, in clinical trials where you have patients that you don't influence their diet. You don't influence their um, lifestyle. So uh, when we, in our, in some of our, and again, these are small trials The they're, this research is really, I would say in its infancy, uh, but those patients that have had the intravenous vitamin C with their chemotherapy, uh, 
um, we have shown prolongation of life and improvement in, in the quality of life. Okay. No, that's excellent. Are there any other intravenous vitamins that could be used or are they dangerous for some reason? I know, I know some are fat soluble, some uh-huh. are, are water soluble, but are there any other water soluble ones that could be used or, or even fat soluble ones in small amounts in a cocktail? Uh, you know, that's something that we've looked at after a fashion because that's something that's very important. So let me talk about two things. One is the glutathione and the other is uh, chelation therapy. So uh, let's start with the chelation therapy. When you think of uh, chelation, that just means something that's in the body that, or in nature that can bind a metal and either remove it or use it, whatever. So it's kind of a generic term. But since the 70s, there's been a practice called chelation therapy, and that's been pretty much co-opted. The term chelation therapy has been pretty much co-opted by the use, and it's a very specific chelator called EDTA. Now, it isn't just this chelator in the bag that, that the doctors are using for cardiovascular disease, let's say. There's other components in that bag. There's vitamin um, C, for example, there's seven grams of vitamin C. There's magnesium. There are a number of the B vitamins. Uh, there's um, sodium bicarb to buffer the pH. So there's this cocktail in this bag that got called chelation therapy. And so the reason I bring this up is that it's all of these nutrients that are probably having the effect where it's found to have an effect. And then, so that might be a good thing, right? So you add these things in a cocktail and you can infuse them. But then on the other hand, in cancer care, when you're giving IV vitamin C as a pro-oxidative therapy, you don't want to add something that's an antioxidant. So for a long time, a lot of the cancer doc, on call the uh, integrated cancer doctors were adding glutathione to the IV vitamin C concoction. And that glutathione is a very powerful antioxidant and it's very important for breaking down hydrogen peroxide. So if you're giving IV vitamin C as a cancer therapy, you don't want to give the glutathione at the same time. And that's, that's what was happening. The glutathione can be very helpful. There's a a condition called neuropathy where when you get the chemotherapy, you can get numbness and tingling of that hands and feet and, you know, some other side effects from the chemotherapy and the glutathione seem to help with those side effects. So it does have its place, but it's just not something you'd want to give hand in hand with the vitamin C. Now, to your question, are there other things that are a concern? And yes, there's also something called alpha lipoic acid that's being being given routinely by integrative oncologists with the vitamin C. And again, alpha lipoic acid is a very powerful antioxidant. It can uh, it's a it's a very uh, it's a wonderful antioxidant. It helps with uh, liver toxicity. It can help with uh, mushroom poisoning. Uh, That's why they give uh, mucamist because it'll form alpha lipoic acid and, and help with glutathione production. So the question we have is alpha lipoic acid important to give with intravenous vitamin C, or should it be given on another day uh, like the glutathione? So that's a study that we're going to try and get done this year. But in terms of the fat soluble vitamins like vitamin D, you'd only want to use a little bit and you wouldn't want to do it two or three times a week like we do with the water soluble vitamin C. So that was actually a very good question. And I may have. That's the only difference I know of in vitamins is fat soluble versus water water soluble. (laughs) I know there's there's many other differences, but. That's all I learned in medical school too. And yeah. nutrition was an, opt- an optional course, and it was held on Saturday morning. Now, what medical student is going to get out of bed Saturday morning? <laughs> well, if you think about it, let's say you live you know, like 85 years. The only inputs to your body are food, water, and air. But of course, medical science says that has no bearing on the body, which is you know, it's kind of funny if, if you put it that way. you know. It's like it's so simple in people's minds 
even though it's a very complicated story. It's so simple that most doctors think, well, how can that be important? How can food or how can vitamins and minerals be important? Well, they just don't understand their biochemistry. They learned it in medical school and promptly forgot it. Yeah, I mean, again, what else keeps you alive your whole lifetime? That, so, I mean, I, I don't see how it could not have a tremendous bearing on your body. It makes no sense. Absolutely. So I mean, you mentioned way earlier in the call that, you know, censorship and fines and all the other stuff. So uh, clinically, can this still be done? How is it done? Is it done like on the sly or what, what, do, what do you have to do? Is it outside the U.S.? Or? It's, it's practiced. All of these therapies are practiced routinely in the United States. And, you know, if a, if a physician or a doctor or even a naturopathic doctor, you know, if they have a drug and it hasn't been studied for, let's say, cancer extensively, so it's not considered part of the mainstream, they can still use that drug under what's called off-label use. So IV vitamin C can be given in the United States. And in fact, there's so many IV vitamin C clinics everywhere. Now, if you, you know, today someone was asking me about San Diego, uh, where they could find an, an integrative oncologist in San Diego. And if you look at San Diego, there's so many IV vitamin C clinics now. How would you know <laughs> who to choose if you didn't have someone to help you? So, and they even have vans now that go around and deliver IV vitamin C to people. They're called uh, hangover vans. So it's, it's really morphed into something I just am surprised about. I just would have never guessed this in the nineties. Um, yeah. I've, I've seen uh, certain clinics, you're right. Offering cocktails like the immunity boost or, you know, the mm-hmm. recovery boost. And it has like five or six different things in it, you know, glutathione, vitamin C, et cetera. But from your knowledge vantage point, in addition to cancer, what, what else is a good, another benefit of intravenous vitamin C? What are some other uses? For? I love it for infection. Let's say, so for example, we had students uh, come to us that had been diagnosed with uh, mononucleosis, for example, and they were so sick, their livers were enlarged, their spleen was enlarged, their lymph nodes were enlarged, and they were told that they needed to take a month or so off from school, uh, from college. And so what we did, and I learned this from Hugh Reardon, was um, the first day you give them 25 grams, and I didn't even mention the dose, give them 25 grams of vitamin C in the vein, maybe with some B vitamins and some magnesium, And they're pretty wiped out. They're sitting there, they're slumped in the the recliner. They're just not doing very well. The second day they come back for their second dose, we might give them 25 or 50, depending. And the second day they brought their video games with them. So they're engaging with their phones or whatever. The third day they come back, they're bringing their schoolwork with them. And we give them their third dose and they're ready to go back to school. So- it can really improve mononucleosis. And we know because of that hydrogen peroxide effect, I mean, that's how our white cells, that's one of the actions the white cells do. They form hydrogen peroxide. So when they envelop that bacteria or virus, they can kill it with the the hydrogen peroxide. So it's something the body does to kill infection. Hmm. You know, have you you read about uh, nebulized uh, hydrogen peroxide and would that have, a different delivery and, you know, similar effect to intravenous vitamin C? Well, you have to be careful with taking hydrogen peroxide, either nebulized or if it's very, 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 very dilute in sterile water, in a nebulizer, maybe. But you have to be careful because hydrogen peroxide delivered in certain ways, particularly if it's not done by someone who's been trained in the use of that type of therapy, uh, you can damage yourself. You can damage your stomach if you try to drink it. You can uh, you can damage your lungs if you try and breathe it, uh, if it's not prepared correctly. And some people think they can drink it and it'll get into the bloodstream and have the same effect as IV vitamin C, but it doesn't. It absolutely cannot get out of the stomach 
and it cannot get in the bloodstream. And we've shown that even if some got in the bloodstream, it would be quenched. It would be wiped out. It would be gone. So mm. the best delivery method for hydrogen peroxide in that extracellular space is IV vitamin C. Mm. Okay. And I yeah, didn't I even mention dose. But, yeah. yeah. So dose is really important. So people that have infection, let's say they feel like they're getting a cold or something simple. We usually start with just 25 grams and that's a pretty good tonic. So it, it can really, the vitamin C can get into the adrenal glands and make you feel a little bit more balanced and energized. It gets into the brain. There's a feel good effect. So it has these wonderful tonic like of properties for lack of a better word. And so that's a pretty nice starting dose, 25 grams. Um, if someone's pretty seriously ill, uh, we like to go up to 50 grams uh, for let's say an infection or some other problem. But when it starts, when you start talking about cancer, we usually uh, like to go up from 50 grams to even as much as 100, 125 grams per dose, not milligrams, but grams. And this can be safely infused. We, uh, Kay Chen and I did a pharmacokinetic study at KU Medical Center. We're uh, getting it ready for publication right now. And we went from one gram up to 100 grams in healthy people, and then 25, 50, 75, and 100 grams in cancer patients no longer getting chemotherapy or radiation therapy. So we, we wanted to see what, how this uh, was to handled by the body. Um, how quickly it was excreted? Was there any toxic side effects, even at the, you know, particularly at the highest dose? And there's all of these medical myths like um, it'll cause kidney stones and it will uh, cause calcium shifts and it'll damage your kidneys. So we took lots of blood samples and looked at all of those indices. We, and we, checked the kidneys, we checked the heart, and we did not find any adverse events, even at the highest dose. So uh, I, you know, that we've got to get that paper published here pretty quickly, but uh, it was, it was an important paper. So what, what I'm saying all of this is that even at the highest doses, vitamin C seems to be very safe. It's a remarkable drug. No, oh, that's excellent. What, what do you think is going to be possible over the next, you know, couple of years with the intravenous vitamin C? Where is this well, headed? What we're doing now is looking at a cell tissue and animal model of uh, SARS-CoV-2, a COVID-19 animal model. And mm -hmm. we're trying to show where our hypothesis is that the uh, vitamin C given at a certain concentration to form the hydrogen peroxide will uh, effectively kill the virus. So we're hoping that we can go on to clinical trials in humans. The climate is not very friendly right now to uh, nutrition support. And so uh, we're hopeful, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we had a lot of pushback. Well, I mean, it's, it's out there and clinics are offering it and it seems to be uh, for now. Okay. But I guess there could be a sudden, uh, you know, attack on it. So, uh. okay. Well, very good. How do people find out where to get um, intravenous vitamin C and what, what kind of practitioner should they speak to to evaluate whether it's good for them or not? Well, they absolutely have to find somebody who's trained. So there are several organizations, uh, American College for Advancement in Medicine, ACAM.org is one where they can find practitioners who are trained in intravenous therapies. The uh, American Academy of Naturopathic Physicians, AANP, also um, has trained naturopathic doctors that are, know how to give intravenous vitamin C. And there's other organizations like the Institute for Functional Medicine. They're less, uh, their members are less likely to have training in vitamin C, but uh, that's another organization. And then uh, A4M, the number four, A4M um, also has a, a list of practitioners that know how to give intravenous vitamin C. So there are people that are trained uh, around this country and around the world. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Jeannie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and, and I really appreciate it. 
Well, you were so great to ask me. Thank you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.